Oh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Thomas Jung Center uh, webinar on the history and future of modeling materials and interesting potentials. We have uh, three very interesting speakers this afternoon. Professor Richard Catlow, um, Professor Olivier Hardouin du Parc, and, and uh, Professor Sally Price, who will talk to us about modeling materials with interesting potentials, all from, uh, from three different aspects or from three different material classes in organic materials, metals, and uh, organic materials. Uh, the first speaker will be, uh, and after each of the talks, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. It would be great if you can, in the first instance, put your questions in the, uh, in the chat, and then I will use that uh, to invite you, if you should please, to uh, ask a question uh, orally afterwards. Cool, uh, Richard, if you can share your slides. I'll I will sharing. try. Perfect. I can see your. Um, I can see your slides. All looks good. So, uh, Richard, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, thank you for inviting me to this very, very interesting uh, uh, symposium on the interatomic potentials, kind of past and present. Um, what I'm going to do in this talk, I'm first going to do kind of take the historical aspect and talk about some of the work I did earlier in my career. Uh, which is, was entirely based on interatomic potentials, because I think that will give you a, a feeling for how the field of modeling in organic materials developed. I'll then look at three topics, structure prediction, surface modeling, and defect modeling, uh, describe recent work, but again, try and then put it in the context of how the field uh, developed. So I thought I'd start with just by looking at a number of areas of modeling that I've been involved in. Um, where we seek to develop models increasingly predictive of materials at the atomic level. I'll be talking later about modeling of structures, uh, which I think has been a very successful field over the last 20, 30 years. Surfaces and interfaces, uh, modeling is now absolutely integral to surface science as it is to our understanding of defects and atomic transports, and I'll highlight all those areas. There are other areas, absorption and diffusion, synthesis, nucleation and growth, where modeling has made a very big contribution to the field. I won't have time to talk about those. I will discuss nanochemistry. Um, again, of course, modeling, huge contribution to our understanding of electronic structure, reactivity and catalysis, but those are for another day. And I'm concerned uh, throughout my career with modeling at the atomic and molecular level, but I, of course, note that the link to larger and length and time scales is hugely important. So let me go back to the early days. Um, my early scientific career was concerned with modeling disorder in solids. And what I really want to show you is how powerful, really rather simple, interatomic potentials prove to be in this field and really perhaps help to establish modeling as a technique in the modeling of complex inorganic materials. I'll talk about three topics. First is where I started, that is understanding defects and disorder in uranium dioxide. Then that move on to the general issues of how we get high levels of disorder in non-stoichiometric compounds. And then just a word on the structure of glassy silicas and silicates. So let me go back right to the beginning of my career. I did my, I was an Oxford PhD student, uh, but I did my uh, PhD essentially working at the UK Atomic Energy Research Establishment at Harwell. And uh, my project concerned uranium dioxide, which is the fuel, still is the fuel for fission, for the majority of fission reactors. Um, after discussion with my supervisor, Alan Lydiard, who you, you can see there, who is a very fine physicist, um, we decided that the, the project would have these three components. First, I would need to derive an interatomic potential model for uranium dioxide, then implement them implement this in the recently developed Mott Littleton code, developed by Michael Norgut at Harwell, had a very big impact on the field, and that would allow us to calculate defect energies, uh, defect formation and activation energies. Now that's all easier said than done. Um, deriving the interatomic potential proved far from easy. Um, I developed a least squares fitting program I spent about nine months getting absolutely nowhere. So any PhD students listening to this can realize that often you do spend time 
uh, getting absolutely nowhere. I then tried to do something simpler, and that was develop a model for calcium fluoride, which has the same fluoride structure as UO2. That was more successful, except that I found that it was difficult to pin down the potential for the interaction between the fluoride ions. Uh, so what I decided to do together with Mike Haynes was essentially calculate the interaction between these two fluoride ions. So treat F22 minus as a molecule and um, apply standard molecular orbital theory to it and, and calculate the energy as a function of internuclear separation. And that worked, it worked very well. And this is my first publication published about 50 years ago. I then went back to uranium dioxide, having got a better feel for the parameters in these potentials. And now I succeeded in developing this model for UO2. And rarely has a student been happier with a very boring table of numbers than the one you see before you. But these are the parameters we developed for a simple Bohr model, ionic model potential for uranium dioxide with a Buckingham, that's an exponential uh, form for the short range potential. And it worked pretty well. What we're doing here is comparing the calculated values for this model uh, with those uh, observed experimentally. There were two models, one fully ionic and one partially ionic. We in fact found that the fully ionic on the whole was rather better. But if you look quickly at those numbers, you'll see we reproduce the lattice parameter, the elastic constants, the dielectric constants, crucially important, key aspects of the phonon dispersion curves. Uh, less accurate on the lattice energy, which in uh, recent work we've become more concerned about. Nevertheless, it worked. And then just briefly, how do we use this? I'm not going to burden you with more tables of numbers, but we were able to show that we developed models for the defect structure of UO2 that were compatible with experiment, oxygen disorder, oxygen vacancy and interstitial disorder, Frenkel disorder dominates, um, Shock disorder dominates over uranium frankel, so that means uh, the cationic defects will be cation vacancies, and then oxygen is far more mobile than uranium. And then I'll come on to the electronic disorder in a moment. And they're absolutely fascinating interstitial clusters in non stoichiometric uh, UO2, and the work we did there tied in very nicely with neutron uh, data. Now, What's the relevance of this? In fact, it does turn out to be hugely relevant to practical applications of UO2 as a nuclear fuel. One of the key properties of the material is creep. It's a crucial mechanical property that influences fuel behavior. It was known that it was highly sensitive to oxygen partial pressure, which is changes as the fuel burns up. It's controlled by the slowest moving iron, which is uranium, and we know that uranium moves by migration of cation vacancies. Those are the dominant cationic defects. And if you plug in this defect model, you can show that cation vacancies are enhanced at high PO2. You can then plug in the numbers and a detailed theory can predict behavior as a function of P and T. So that's pretty useful. The second really useful thing was this, uh, I think, interesting finding. Um, these very simple calculations were able to show that the energy for this process, it was a crude way of estimating it, but that it was fairly low, this kind of essentially kind of disproportionation energy, or in physics language, this is the Mott Hubbard gap. Um, uh, it's about 2 EV. Now, what you see experimentally with UO2, high temperature, there's a very big specific heat excess. If you heat the, the material up, it starts absorbing uh, heat. And that's crucially important in modeling accident scenar scenarios. This model here explains that specific heat excess. And in fact, it was used in a very detailed study by Marshall Stoneham and John Harding to develop a detailed theory of the high temperature specific heat. All this was collected together in a paper published in the late 1970s in Proceedings of the Royal Society. Now, before I leave this earlier work, just let's kind of generalize this of looking at one material. Uh, disordered solids are absolutely fascinating. They still fascinate me. Um, I was interested, as were many people, how can you accommodate these very high levels of disorder of defects in solids? And they're really kind of two ways. Uh, the one is by clustering the defects, and we've got a nice example here, iron, non-stoichiometric iron oxide, worcestite, absolutely classic uh, 
system in solid state chemistry. And what modeling was able to show is you get these complex, can you see there, vacancy clusters with interstitials in the middle. And again, ties in beautifully with experimental data. The other way, in fact, is to eliminate defects by the process of crystallographic shear. And again, modeling helped us understand that, but I haven't time to talk about that. Here are the paper I published with Brian Fender, again, showing these very complex defect clusters and demonstrating their stability in iron oxide, ties in beautifully with experimental neutron data. And here's, a, I think, a, a really significant piece of work published in the mid 1980s. This concerned rare earth doped calcium fluoride, a material that's very extensively studied as it's used in laser applications. And while working with Alan Chadwick at the University of Kent, we were able to show by a combination of modeling and EXAFs, which was just beginning to be used there, X-ray spectroscopy, in exploring complex problems in solid state and materials chemistry, that when you dope this system at high dopant levels, you get this beautiful cluster you see there on the cover of nature with six of these dopant ions in an octahedron surrounded by a cloud of the red fluoride ion interstitials. Now, one of the reasons I've shown this is all this work was done using rather simple ionic model, mainly pair potentials. Um, nevertheless, they allowed modeling to make contact with experiment and showed that modeling really could be a tool to help us understand these complex systems. So that's some, just before I leave history, um, I was interested, this is later on in modeling amorphous materials. Here is a model developed by Molecular dynamics melt quench for the structure of amorphous silica. Uh, it's a beautiful structure. It's still a corner sharing network, but um, no long range order in it. And again, that ties in pretty well uh, with neutron data, but again, based on relatively simple intratomic potentials. So that's kind of history. Let's talk more about the present. And I said there'll be three themes, crystal structure prediction, um, modeling of surfaces and modeling of defect. Crystal structure prediction has been an interest of mine and of many people uh, for several decades, and it's a real challenge. But again, we had some early successes. Uh, this is the main paper from the PhD thesis of Steve Parker, who was a student working with me then at, at UCL. Uh, Steve is now a very senior professor at the University of Bath. What Steve was able to do, again, is show that rather simple pair potential models could model the structures, certainly, of complex silicate systems. And th in this case, modeling chain structured silicates and helping to understand how the structure of the chain depends upon the uh, cation in the pyroxenoid material. But let's get back, those, those, I should say that that work wasn't prediction, it was successful modeling. But let's think about actual prediction. And here's quite a famous quotation. Remember John Maddox in Nature in 1988? One of the continuing scandals in the physical sciences is it remains impossible to predict the structures of even the simplest crystalline solids from a knowledge of their composition. Now, when Maddox came out with that statement, he really was inaccurate. Um, so it wasn't terribly good science. It was fantastic journalism. It really stimulated the field. And in fact, I got in touch with Maddox and said, look, you got it wrong we can do a lot in this field. And he said, well, you go and write me an article to be published in Nature. So I did that and worked with David Price uh, for an article that I think has been quite influential. Uh, then in 2008, Scott Woodley, who's done a great deal in this field, and I kind of wrote a, a, an article on structure prediction 20 years after the Maddox challenge. Here it is. I think it's still quite relevant. And then very recently, we brought the field up to date working with Graham Day, who's done some beautiful work, earlier work with Sally in this field. Uh, this is in uh, Phil Trans Royal Society. It discusses all the different search methods and then also emphasizes the role that machine learning is now playing in the field. So let me just give you, well, first, let's see what you'd need to predict structures. Now, uh, of course, people are increasingly using machine learning and uh, machine learning is, is having and is going to have a big impact on the field. If you take the, as it were, the more traditional ways, what essentially you have to do is search configurational space as defined by the coordinates of the atoms. 
uh, you find regions of configurational space that are likely to correspond to a structure, a stable structure, and then you couple that with energy minimization to predict the detailed structure of the system. And so the methods involved, I say, all will involve energy minimization at the end, optimization of a lattice energy or a quantum mechanically calculated cohesive energy. And then I'm not going to go in any detail. These are the, on the whole, the methods that are used. Genetic algorithm, algorithms very much developed, well, a lot of the development work done by Scott Woodley, um, topological modeling, simulated annealing, and then, of course, from molecular crystals, packing with energy minimization. Sally, far a better place to talk about that than me. There has been some success in using simply random starting points, using computer power to uh, generate large numbers of starting points and then applying minimization. I said there's been quite a lot of success there. I think it can become problematic when you look at really complex systems. I mean, of course, as I've said, machine learning and relating techniques. Let me just give you a couple of examples. The first, this is from the Liverpool group, uh, Chris Collins, Matt Rosinski, and others, and I should stress I had nothing to do with this work. It's a beautiful, elegant piece of work published in Nature four or five years ago. In fact, what they do, they first use their kind of inorganic chemistry intuition, and instead of using atoms, as it were, as the, uh, the objects to be arranged, uh, they use uh, structural motifs. So they take cl clusters of atoms, which they think are gonna correspond to stable structures. They then try and fit these together using a Monte Carlo algorithm with intratomic potentials. They select the best structure. They can then refine it by DFT and it really works. They applied this approach to a very complex ternary oxide system and they predicted a structure. Uh, you can see the structure on the left-hand side um, and it really is, it, it works. They predicted this structure, they then synthesized it, determined the structure, solved the diffraction pattern, and it uh, is as predicted. So a beautiful piece of work. Uh, the second is work by Rob Bell, my good colleague now here at UCL. Rob has done a lot of work on structure prediction for zeolites. These are framework structured silica and aluminosilicate systems, very widely used in uh, industry, catalysis, separation technologies, uh, and also for ion exchange. Um, they're all essentially corner sharing networks of SiO4 and ALO4 tetrahedra. And so you can treat structure prediction here as a topological problem. How can you fit tetrahedra together? How can you enumerate systematically the possible networks that you can generate? They use a topological theory known as tiling theory, uh, whose use for, um, zeolite structure prediction, very much uh, pioneered by Jack Klinowski in Cambridge. Uh, but they use that and what they can do is systematically develop models for these topologies. And then you can kind of convert your topology into a structure. So on the top right hand side there, you have a topology. That's a way of kind of connecting um, the corners of the structure together. You can then convert that into a structure by when we say silicon atoms at the vertices, oxygen atoms along the edges. That's then a structure, and you can feed that into a lattice energy minimization program using an intratomic potential or using density functional theory if you wish. And you can predict new structures. These are structures that were predicted. They were predicted to have low energies. As far as thermodynamics is concerned, they should be synthesizable. They're a challenge now to the uh, solid state synthetic chemists. And here are some even more intriguing ones. These are structures that were predicted again to be stable as silica or aluminosilicate systems. They're not known, they haven't yet been synthesized as zeolites, but they are available with other compositions. You can see the compositions here. So those networks are stable structures. Now, there's a lot more I could say about structure prediction. Before I leave, uh, just one quick word here. A student working with me at Cardiff, Ed Stacey, has done a really beautiful job doing detailed calculations on the energies of microporous systems with respect to the energy of dense silica systems. So if you're looking at a silica at microporous system, you calculate the energy per T site relative to that of alpha quartz, which is the dense silica. Now, all these microporous systems are metastable with respect to dense silica 
silica silicates and alumino silicates. Uh, and this beautiful calorimetric data from Alex Navrotsi's group has actually measured the thermodynamics of this metastability. And what you're seeing here is a comparison that Ed made between, let's first look at the DFT, that was the middle common uh, column, and experimental data. And the agreement's terrific. It's on the whole within the experimental error. One or two are a little bit outside the experimental error, but generally within experimental error. Now, this is a case where you look at the potentials, those are on the left hand side, there's a significant error there. The potentials give a value that's too high. We're not quite sure what's the case. It probably is that there's a slight, a very slight redistribution of charge when you go from a dense uh, to a less dense structure, and that isn't picked up by the potentials, it is picked up by DFT. Now, before I leave structure prediction, here are some questions that, you know, we might want to ask ourselves in the future. Search algorithms versus machine learning. What's, I think both have a role. What are the relative role? Effective synergies between ab initio and potential based methods. Um, they both have a role to play, but again, let's try and use them together as effectively as we can. Let me move on quickly. My second theme is oxide surfaces and supporting nanoparticles. And I focus here on zinc oxide, very widely studied owing to its wide range of applications, including as a commercial methanol synthesis catalyst. Now, before I go on though, let me just mention a landmark publication in our understanding of the surface structures of uh, ionic, and I should say sem semi-ionic uh, crystals. This is a paper by Phil Tasker in the late 1970s. And while Phil was able, working at Harwell, Phil was able to show that if a ionic system or semi-ionic, a polar solid, has a, a dipole moment in the repeat unit perpendicular to the surface, that surface is intrinsically unstable. And that's a really important result. It must be stabilized in some way. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So let's get on to recent work, Devin Marafons on stabilities and structures of zinc oxide surfaces. A word about zinc oxide, it's a very widely studied material with a lot of applications. It's a wide bang up semiconductor. It's got a fascinating uh, surface chemistry, as we'll see in a minute, good transparency, high electron mobility, luminescent properties, and these give rise to this big range of applications. It's a simple ionic crystal structure, Wurzite structure for coordination of zinc and oxygen, um, but it's got four surfaces. Now, two of them are nonpolar. They don't have this problem that Tasker identified. They will be stable. Two of them are polar, and it's the polar ones that are often really important. Uh, they are the ones that have applications in catalysis. Now, how do you stabilize a polar surface? Well, the three ways you can do it, you can do what we call metallize. That means you just transfer electrons between the bulk and the surface region. You can create vacancies. The vacancies, charge vacancies can quench the surface dipole. Uh, that is the method, the mechanism that we will see that zinc oxide tends to adopt. Or you can absorb, say, hydroxyl groups whose dipole moment, again, will cancel out the surface dipole. So these are the surface models. The top, we're looking at the nonpolar surfaces, which are absolutely fascinating. I don't have time to talk about them. Now, one of your problems have with the polar surfaces, we introduce defects, but there are lots of different ways you can organize those defects. Uh, and so we use a Monte Carlo algorithm in a software developed by Scott Woodley, KLMC, to explore these different orientations. And um, for these, this stage of exploration, we use intratomic potentials using the gulp code. We then feed in the optimal structures found by the potentials into DFT with the VASP code and come up with detailed predictions. Let me go through this quickly. Here is experiment. What you see on the surface of zinc oxide, this is a zinc terminated surface. You see these beautiful surface microscopy, you see these beautiful triangular structures. Now, very nice work nearly 20 years ago by York Cressy was able to show that if you constructed those, they were stable. But we wanted to go a step beyond and show that they dropped out naturally from this Monte Carlo analysis, and they do. This is the global optimization, and these triangular features drop out naturally. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, the same, if you look at the polar surface, you get this complex uh, structure of the oxygen terminated surface revealed by again, beautiful surface microscopy. 
you can use this Monte Carlo algorithm followed finally by DFT refinement. And again, these structures drop out. So all really quite satisfying. So zinc oxide, very complex surface structure for a simple oxide. Um, I haven't time to talk about the non-polar surfaces. You have these triangular patterns on polar surfaces and we're getting DFT to work together with the potential base calculations. Now, a few words on um, nanoparticles on zinc oxide. This again is work of David Morafons, student who worked with us now back in Mexico. Uh, and again, the part of the incentive for this is that copper zinc oxide is very, very widely studied for its catalytic properties. So what do we do here? Well, first again, we develop interatomic potentials for the ways for to describe the copper surface interactions. Uh, and though we can then feed those into optimization algorithms, just how do we develop the potential? We take pairs, clusters of copper atoms, we bring them down on the surface and we then fit those to uh, an, an interatomic potential. This is a, a functionalized potential. You can see here the agreement between calculated uh, and between the DFT calculated energies and the fitted energies is in fact very good. You can feed these in and you can then show how these clusters grow on the surface. We're adding atoms to them. We're using this potential model to explore where the co copper atoms are, but we then do refine with DFT. And in fact, what you see is this copper cluster wets the surface and spreads out. You can then look at how the cluster interacts with features on the surface. Uh, terraces and step sites and what in fact you find is that it's most strongly bound at the steps, uh, yeah, the step sites uh, and that again ties in very very nicely with experiment. Um, you can see here beautiful again very elegant surface microscopy with these clusters accumulating at step sites. Now I really haven't time, I can see my time is running out to talk much about more recent work by Michael Hyam. I'll just run through the slides uh, to make the point that Michael has now studied um, how these clusters grow on the polar surfaces. The previous work I should have said was on the non-polar surfaces. Again, he uses this Monte Carlo algorithm and you can see the ways in which these clusters grow. Here we've got seven, eight copper atoms, 24, 50 copper atoms. And again, all intratomic potentials refined by DFT. We then compare the potentials with the DFT. The absolute values of the energies are the same, but the ranking of different structures is pretty similar with potentials and DFT. And the lowest energy structure is the same with DFT as with the potentials. Now, Michael is looking at the actual catalytic properties, how carbon dioxide is absorbed on the surface of these nano clusters and how it's then hydrogenated uh, in the catalytic mechanism that leads to methanol formation. Now, before I leave surfaces and supported nanoparticles, just some issues. The procedures for reconstructing surfaces, we use this Monte Carlo algorithm, but is it the best way of doing it? I think that needs some thought. I think there's a lot of work to be done about how we optimize surface nanoparticle interactions. And then I think, as I said, with the crystal structure prediction, we need effective synergies. I think to a large extent we have these, but perhaps we can have even better, closer interaction between ab initio and potential based methods. Now, my th third theme uh, relates to defects in oxides. And here again, I'm going to stick with zinc oxide because it's such an important and widely studied material. And here I'll be in fact highlighting work that's just about to be published undertaken by a student in our group, King Hao, working with John Buckeridge, Yu, uh, Yu Lu and Tom Keel at Darsbury and Alexei Sokol here at UCL. Now I say very, there's a big literature on defects in zinc oxide, not very well understood. So how do we approach this? Well, we, our approach now to modeling defects in inorganic materials is mainly to use hybrid QM MM methods. So these, in fact, are combining uh, ab initio with uh, intratomic potential methods. Now, it's an old method based on a simple idea, uh, but it's one that has become very effective, both in molecular, uh, in computational molecular biology and increasingly in solid state science. 
Um, so what do you do? Well, I think you all know this probably. You kind of focus your quantum mechanical fire on the region that you're interested in. That's the defect and surrounding lattice. You then embed that in a representation of the surrounding lattice, uh, the more distant parts of the lattice, which are described by interatomic potentials. Now, very importantly, you need an interface region between the quantum mechanical and the interatomic potential region. For ionic solids, we use um, whole ion pseudopotentials. And then again, for ionic solids, you need to surround the whole cluster the QMMM cluster by point charges to ensure that the Madeleine potential is described very accurately. But this kind of approach is available in the ChemShell software, developed at Darsbury, originally by Paul Sherwood, and now the development very much led uh, by Tom Keel. And I'll just give you a couple of results. Um, these are results for the native defects in, in zinc oxide. And here you can do the calculations um, as a function, as a function of um, oxygen partial pressure, oxygen chemical potential, and also you can see how the defect energies vary with the position of the Fermi level. And what you can show is in what we call oxygen rich, that is systems with very high, with high oxygen partial pressures, corresponding actually roughly to the ambient. Uh, the dominant defects, in fact, are zinc vacancies. You look on the right hand side, the oxygen rich, you can see that black line, the lower energy, when you're close to the, when the Fermi level is close to the conduction band, uh, we're predominating zinc vacancies, which doesn't surprise us, but it's important that this is confirmed, neutral zinc vacancies. You get the converse when you go to the what we call the zinc rich, that's the very low oxygen partial pressure, where you get predominantly oxygen vacancies, those are neutral oxygen vacancies, those are the red line there. Nothing surprising, but there's been a lot of confusion in the literature, and I think this is helping to sort it out. You can then look at impurities. Uh, these are copper, but an important purity impurity copper in zinc oxide and again you can show under most ambient conditions the stable mm -hmm. configuration for this is copper substituting for a zinc iron and copper in the divalent state so a neutral defect a net neutral defect now again not surprising but important to verify that so that's what we're doing the kind of thing we do now but let's just again glance at what was going on in the early days with intratomic potentials. This is some early work. It was in fact undertaken by a Oxford PhD student working with myself and Brian Fender, uh, then at the Institute La Langevin and John Harding at Harwell. Uh, this was concerned with the uh, oxygen conductivity in cerium dioxide. Now, cerium dioxide very, very intensely studied. Um, because it's uh, a good, it's actually got applications in catalysis and uh, solid, it's a good solid electrolyte. Key aspect is oxygen ion conductivity. You can enhance that by doping with trivalent ions because they induce uh, oxygen vacancies as compensators. Now, a crucial factor controlling the conductivity is the energy of interaction between the dopant trivalent dopant and the oxygen vacancy, because the oxygen vacancy will be trapped at these dopants with a greater or lesser binding energy. We were able to calculate that binding energy, you'll see on the bottom right hand side, for four dopants with different ionic radii, and we get pretty good agreement. This again is a simple potential based calculation, pretty good agreement between modelling and experiment. The case for yttrium, not quite as good, but for Scandium, it's excellent for gadolinium, which is the most widely used dopant now. Again, excellent agreement and pretty good agreement for lanthanum. So again, that was early work showing how these methods could really help us understand uh, experiment. And here's a slide that I found interesting. This is about defects in magnesium oxide. Again, very intensively studied. And I'm taking three pieces of work. The first is some old work by myself and Michael Norgut where we calculated the shock key energy, the energy to form uh, compensating um, from stoichiometric uh, proportions of cation and anion vacancies and the vacancy migration energy. Uh, and you see, we get values kind of around 7.5 EV for the shock key, just over two EV for the migration energy. Then ooh, 
10, 15 years later, um, DFT is applied very effectively by Sandra De Vita and Mike Gillen. They get a slightly lower shock key energy, but it's pretty close. I should say the values, these values time well with experiment. Migration energy is a very little bit higher, but again, pretty close. Uh, there's probably about at least six orders of magnitude difference in the computer requirements of the DFT versus the Mott Littleton. They then use move to quantum Monte Carlo, where there's probably at least another six orders of magnitude over the DFT work of Dario Alfa and Mike Gillen. They get a shock key energy very similar to that we obtained with the Mott Littleton. Now, the message is here is not that the work of Gillen and co-workers wasn't needed. It was needed. It's very good and elegant work. The message is, though, that the Mott Littleton worked and it worked because it had the physics that you need. The physics of forming a defect in an ionic crystal is controlled by electrostatics, short range repulsion and polarization. And all those are modeled in an intratomic potential that then is then implemented in a Mott Littleton calculation. So sometimes simple methods work. Anyway, defect structures, I've nearly finished. Um, some of the issues, again, QMMM versus periodic. Periodic, huge literature on periodic calculations on defects. Um, both have a role, but we need to think about when we use one, when we use the other. I think there is a continuing role of potential-based methods. Um, sometimes they may be more effective than DFT. And again, I've said this, <laughs> this is the third time I've said this, effective synergies between ab initio and potential methods. Now, this is more or less my last slide. Just some reflections on the way materials modeling, or at least the part of materials modeling that I've been involved in, how it's evolved over the last, I don't know, 40 years or more. If we look back to the 70s and 80s, the, the kind of work I was describing earlier, it was based on intratomic potential methods. It's largely, um, it was very difficult to do much more than that. But nevertheless, as I showed, they made a really big contribution and um, helped to get the field off the ground. If we move to the 1990s, there's then the rapid growth of electronic structure methods, improvement in algorithms, and of course, growth in hardware. If we look at you know, 2000 to 2020, absolute dominance of DFT. And in fact, in many cases, people almost equated materials modeling with application of DFT. Now we're seeing a resurgence, I think it's first to say, of potential based methods, especially using Mott Little, um, sorry, not model, Mott Little, but machine learning. Uh, models trained on DFT energy services. This is, this is making a big contribution to the field and it will make a bigger contribution to the field. Although, well, not although, but and I think potentials fitted DFT based on some kind of model also have an important role to play. Well, look, I'll conclude. I hope I've acknowledged the people who did this work as the talk went along. Um, I just want to actually say how it's certainly in the UK the field of materials modeling has been so effectively supported by consortia, by the collaborative computer projects, by the high-end computing consortia, and of course, by the TYC. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge the big role, certainly in the work I've done, played by the scientific computing departments at Darsbury and RAL. Finally, you'll see in green my acknowledgement to the funders, I've seen them come and go, SRC morphed into SERC, morphed into EPSRC, which is now part of UKRI. And I think all I can say about that is plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, anyway, what I hope I've done in this talk is just given you a feeling for the role of potentials in the field, how they really help the field get off the ground, uh, but how they have a continuing role when they can be used very effectively uh, together with uh, ab initio methods. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? We have time for a couple of, couple of questions. Uh, if you can type your question in the chat. I'll try and take the slides now, Martin. Yeah. So, Johannes, uh, wonderful talk, Richard. Uh, thank you. Can you tell us a bit more about these nine difficult months at the beginning of your PhD? Why was it difficult to find good parameters for uranium di dioxide and what lessons did you learn? Uh, I think it was just lack of a... <laughs> the first thing to say is there really hadn't been many previous attempts to develop intratomic. I mean, it's, thanks for the question, Johannes. Um, uh, 
you know, there hadn't been many previous attempts to develop intratomic potentials for oxide materials. So, you know, we didn't know what kind of parameter space to search in. Um, but what, um, what actually really helped get this going was, I, I think I mentioned that when I tackled calcium fluoride, which actually, although it's the same structure, is a simpler material, then that began to, you began to get a feeling for you know, what are sensible parameters for the Buckingham potential. These, I should say, were shell model potentials. What are the sensible parameters for the shell parameters? And you could build, put that experience back into uh, the UO2. But I mean, fitting into atomic potential, certainly in those days, was an art. And you just needed to get experience and say, find out the region of parameter space that was likely to work. OK, thank you, Richard. Any other questions? Just put them, put them in the chat. I'll just ask a follow up question on that. Is it also with that uh, in between work on fluoride, you you switched to, or did you from the start to uh, use an apanitio derived potential for the anions, or is that something you learned by doing the fluoride phase and then implemented it in the uranium dioxide? The fluoride phase, because we were finding it difficult to pin down the uh, sensible, we didn't, again, it was really, we didn't know what part of parameter space to look in for these anon anon potentials. So I decided to do this ab initio, very crude, I should say, by modern standards, ab initio calculation, but it helped pin that down. I and mean, then, yes, it transferred that experience to the oxygen oxygen interactions in UO2. Cool. Any other questions? I'm seeing, I mean, I can keep asking questions uh, till the proverbial cows come home. And well, I can think one more question. You mentioned the shell model. So what is this sort of, what has been the impact of the shell model? Because we think of interpreting many people who are new to the field think of full ionic charges, but obviously there's, there's two ways to go. In reality, people either use reduced charges or they use the shell model. So can you say a bit more about- Well, they're doing a bit. I mean, you can use, uh, the shell model is describing polarization. And it's a very effective way of describing polarization. The older way of describing polarization, which is just to put, you know, essentially um, a, give each ion a polarizability and uh, calculate the dipole moment, that actually can lead to what's called a polarization catastrophe because it's not modeling the physical basis of polarization, which in fact is displacement of the valence electrons. Now, a shell model very, very crudely does include that physical basis. So you display shells and you have interactions between the shells and that tends to dampen polarizability. But it's, you know, a very crude model developed by Dick and Obeiser in the 1950s. It's proved to be very, very effective um, for modeling ionic and semi-ionic materials. It's a good way, good, simple way, effective way. It's easy to put in a computer code uh, of, uh, uh, of modeling polarizability. Cool. I would say it's, it's yeah, it's crude, but also elegant in its own way. I would. Almost. Yeah, I'd agree. Cool. Since no one else has come up with a question, I think we'll, we we can finish here. Thank you, Richard. Pleasure. Thanks. And then we're going to try to switch to Olivier and see if his uh, slides will now load. So thank you, Martin, and thank thank you to the Thomas Young uh, Center for inviting me for this talk. Uh, so it's my pleasure to remind you the, the fact that Thomas Young was a member of the Société Philomatique de Paris since uh, 1802, and then a um, corresponding member of the Académie des Sciences de Paris. And I thank Richard for his nice uh, word in French at the end. To change pour que rien ne change, something like that. Next slide, please. Yes, so my uh, talk will be more about uh, history and philosophy. And uh, I'll start from the very beginning, even from the Greek, from ex archis, which means ab initio, and uh, starting with Lysippus and Democritus, you had atoms, not our atoms, but their atoms, but they had no forces. So there was no interatomic uh, potential between these atoms, just contact between atoms which had different shapes. Empedocles had forces, attractive and repulsive, but no atoms. 
plateau at elements with polyhedral shapes, but no forces. Aristotle reasonably rejected all these models as leading to paradoxes, and he offered no mechanism in replacement because it was too soon. Next slide. Yes, so the physics and the physical arguments were too poor at that time. No experimental check was possible. It was just free speculation. The kind of atoms for pedicles were kind of what you could see uh, in dust. That was the, the opinion of Gaston Bachelard, a French epistemologist. And Democritus was the laughing philosopher. Maybe he was laughing at us. Next slide. One had to wait for accurate observations in order to propose accurate laws, both from a physical point of view and a mathematical point of view. Galileo, yes, good. Galileo Galilei was the father of, new, of two new sciences and the father of experimental sciences. His first new science was material science, actually. Resistance to fracture and cause to cohesion, cause of cohesion. So what did he have to say about cohesion? Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't have good things to say about the reasons why drops of water can stand on cabbage leaves. So about their internal cohesion, he said, I know for a certainty that it's not owing to any internal tenacity acting between the particles of water. So he was against any intermolecular interaction, probably because some Aristotelians had said the opposite. Next slide. So we had to wait more. And uh, if not for atoms and molecules in a drop of water, it was at least easier to get data on planets. Next slide. And uh, Tycho Brahe uh, came with accurate astronomical observation. Out of these observations, um, Johannes Kepler, next slide, could come with his ellipses and with his three geometric laws. Ellipses are more complex than circles. Next slide. And from these three laws, Isaac Newton with just one law could explain all of them. Next slide. So that, and it was even a numerical success, not just a law, but it worked for the moon. When Newton used the correct value of a degree of arc as measured by Jean Picard, he got the correct value and went on to publish his Principia Mathematica. Next slide. So from the point of view of Newton, if it works, be pragmatic and use the good law. Even if you have no physical explanation, Newton had no physical explanation, but his law also worked for apers on earth. It was a great unification between astronomy and physics on earth. So Newton proposed to go further, to go to interactions and attractions within bodies on earth. He said, it seems to me further that there are certain active principles, such as is, is that of gravity, and they, which can cause the cohesion of bodies. But in his own way, I scruple not to propose and leave their causes to be found for future generations. Next slide. Roger Boscovich tried to go further and try to propose a model with a force alternatively repulsive and attractive between point particles and depending on the distance between these particles. Roger Boscovich was a Jesuit and uh, in a typical Jesuit mind, he tried to unify 
repressive and attractive, depending on ranges, and also tried to unify between Leibniz, who was a continental philosopher and who was Newton's foe, and do a unification with Newton's program. I think he did that because he was a Jesuit, but uh, Leibniz's ideas had nothing to do with his uh, program and his force. Unfortunately, his force model is just a drawing. So no numerical uh, calculations could be done with it. Next slide. This model is uh, for forces. So it's attractive when it's positive and repressive when it's negative. Uh, and there is no, no analytical law and even no numerics. So it's just a drawing. Next slide, please. Then came Laplace, and Laplace was uh, dreaming of a unified theory, a theory of everything in his time. He wanted to deduce all phenomena from interactions between particles, which were called molecules in his time. He said that he wanted to bring back all phenomena in physics and astronomy to only one general, general law a kind of theory of everything. Next slide. Of course, or oh, unfortunately for him, the only sensible thing Laplace could say about forces between molecules is that they are insensible at sensible distances. Next slide. Yet he could study them uh, even if they cannot be directly observed, but they can be studied in a way through indirect analysis, like analysis of uh, capillarity. And about capillarity, we have the young Laplace equation. They are united in this story. Capillarity at least could give orders of magnitude on the range of uh, which forces between molecules are sensible forces and even some ideas about the sizes of these molecules. Next slide. As you know, capillarity is easy and fun to observe. And in Laplace's time, indeed, studies of liquids and their vapors were very important. We, are in, we were in the first industrial revolution with steam machines. Laplace thought there are attractive forces between molecules uh, plus a caloric, which, is a, which was a mysterious fluid that played the role of repulsive forces between molecules. But that was not a real force. So Laplace program, I would say, uh, his program arrived too soon and was certainly too ambitious. Due to its lack of success, that program slowly disappeared and many people thought that the kinetic energy itself was not a good theory because it offered no good explanations and no better than what some competitive theories like energeticism could offer at that time. Once again, one had to wait for more observations, new observations and more accurate ones about sensible atoms before they, even the existence of atoms were recognized. Next slide. Boltzmann believed in the existence of atoms, but you know he ended uh, committing suicide. Next slide. And Van der Waals, Johannes Diederich Van der Waals also believed in the existence of atoms. Max Planck didn't for many years, for 20 years, he didn't believe in the existence of atoms and was more in favor of a continuous uh, energetic, energetic model. Next slide. However, Van der Waals only believed in attractive forces between elastic molecules, so no real um, repulsive forces. And Van der Waals even 
never offered any analytical law for uh, these attractive forces. Next slide. And we owe the name of Vals, uh, Vals forces to Boltzmann. Is, Boltzmann is the one who proposed to name Vals forces, uh, repressive forces, Vals forces. Next slide. In the 1860s, Maxwell tried analytical force, which uh, Van der Waals never did. That was in order to study viscosity of fluids, of gases. He used an S equals to five and one over R5, and it worked more or less for his uh, viscosity measures. Next slide. Uh, 40 years later, Gustav Me used a, a repulsive potential. But potential and force are about the same. There is a difference of plus one in the exponent. He proposed a repulsive potential for elementary solids to study the compressibility and uh, saying he would work at a fixed uh, distance, equilibrium dis distance between atoms in a solid. He also obtained a new equal five as an approximate value as Maxwell, but with no reference to Maxwell. Next slide, because my uh, actually studied solid and not gases uh, and, their, uh, and their viscosities, the reason why Ms. My, me studied solid was to develop a latest model for solids because he was not satisfied with the previous models uh, developed for liquids. He was not interested in solids per se, and the word solid does not appear in his title. Yet studies of solids were slowly starting for metals and other solids, because it was at that time the second industrial revolution using a lot of metals, if only steels for railways and so on. Next slide. So more interesting is Gruneisen, who studied solids per se, and he explicitly considered an analytical law which resembles to what we know as the Leonard Jones law. Gruneisen said X equals three, uh, why not? And uh, his Y was metal dependent. He used his constant to obtain the Y. At that time in 1912, for instance, besides the industrial applications, from a fundamental point of view, it was important to have a model to try to get the characteristic vibration of frequency of atoms in crystals uh, because Einstein's model had proved to be very successful to explain the departure of um, the heat capacity of solids from Dulon and Petit's law at very low temperature. And they wanted to study this dependence in temperature and in volume which is Grunison's constant in the same article. Next slide. Uh, These analytical laws required mat mathematical developments to get complicated series, complicated integrations, to get more accurate uh, results for gas velocity on one side, and also to get uh, some formula to compute latest energies of various crystalline structures as soon as in 1925 by Jones, who worked on gas viscosity and also on uh, crystalline structures. Uh, Jones was Jones until the mid, uh, until mid, um, until 1925. And then married Catherine Leonard and became Leonard Jones afterwards. Harry Jones started his studies under Leonard Jones. And Leonard Jones is also famous for his works on molecular orbitals, 
as a linear combination of atomic orbitals, which is kind of a real, a real point of view on um, molecular orbitals in chemistry. Next slide. Thanks to these uh, mathematical developments for complicated series and the more accurate studies experimentally of gas vi viscosity, they, the same potentials could be used for this fluid gas studies. In 1929, two mathematicians from Bristol and his student choose N equals twice M because they had a, mathem a trigonometrical treatment to get uh, to the end of the calculation. They choose M equals four and hence uh, N equals eight. But at the end of the paper, they concluded that they could also have used a 12, six potential. And they said this potential seems likely to provide interesting results, but they didn't actually use it. Next slide. The reason they probably said that the 12 side was likely to provide, the 12, six potentials was likely to provide interesting results was that uh, Wang, uh, Chinese American student uh, in at New York had carried out a quantum mechanical calculation in 1927, showing that the attraction between two neutral atoms normally is in, in one over R to the six. Fritz London found the same results in 1930. And Leonard Jones used 12 six potentials in 1931 consistently. Next slide. Just a remark uh, that the, the one over R to the 12th for the repressive part cannot be justified from quantum mechanics. So it's just because 12 is equal to twice six. Uh, for the repressive part, uh, an exponential form could be justified from quantum mechanics but in a very limited range actually, so that any other form which would fit that exponential minus alpha r around uh, the equilibrium distance between two atoms could equivalently be used uh, as an analytical law. And uh, people who try to use the Slater repressive potential and the uh, Wang uh, London uh, attractive one uh, got uh, run into problems in Monte Carlo metropolis uh, simulations and molecular dynamics simulations under pressure because that potential goes to minus infinity when R goes to zero, which is a big problem, of course. Uh, next slide. In the 50s, it was recognized that gas studies could not be used to select any good optimized form, either 12 minus six or exponential minus six. And actually these forms are much too simple. The Leonard Jones potentials indeed favor FCC for elementary structures, uh, FCC being uh, lower in energy than simple cubic, as was shown by Jones and Ingham in 1925. Next slide. So it's okay for elementary FCC metals, but unfortunately it was not for quantum mechanical reasons. It was just because uh, Leonard Jones and other potential like that favor capacity. Next slide. And uh, as we know, alkali metals are not FCC, they are body center cubic. And even for elementary FCC metals, we have problems. The Cauchy-Poisson relationship C11 uh, equals uh, C12 equals C44 is not true. And uh, the vacancy formation energy uh, is uh, about the cohesive energy with pair potentials, whereas it was known 
that uh, it was significantly smaller than the cohesive energy per atom. So pair potentials were not good anyway, were not sufficient. And quite reasonably uh, about how to treat cohesive pro properties in a better way uh, beyond using pair potentials, these ideas had to come from solid state quantum mechanics. Next slide. But there was a dichotomy in France and uh, in many other countries. Interatomic potentials deal with atoms in real space. So this is a, a real dichotomy. Whereas solid state quantum mechanics was working uh, in reciprocal space, not in real space. Reciprocal space is an ideal space which requires perfect periodicity in perfect crystals. So there was no room for real life defects that make real life, real crystals interesting, as Charles Frank said. And uh, this, uh, the reciprocal space spirit was not the spirit of a real life approach. Yet, this uh, solid state quantum mechanics and reciprocal space had the electron bands information. So was there a way out of this dichotomy? Next slide. Could it be overcome? Next slide. So next slide again, yes. And here came Jacques Friedel, who paid the way back from the reciprocal space to the real space, still using as much as possible quantum mechanics. Friedel and his collaborators provided rigorous links along the way. For instance, François Siro lachmann and François Ducastel. As we know for metals, for transition metals, Friedel's rectangular D-band model led to the square root of a Z dependence of the bond energy of an atom in transition metals, where Z is the number of nearest neighbors. So we have a real space in terms of a number of nearest neighbors in the band space, in the reciprocal space, in the, in the Briouin zone. Next slide. Yet this uh, contribution of the rectangular bond model was purely attractive. So there was still a problem. Next slide. Next slide. And then one had to wait again for François Ducastel who th simply thought of adding a repulsive pair potential and then derived an analytical formula for unrelaxed defect energies and elastic constants and cohesive energies, of course. He did that in his PhD thesis and in a paper published in Journal de Physique in 1970, both his PhD thesis and this article was were written in French. So it had to be rediscovered later on. Next slide. Uh, another dichotomy was between solid state physicists and material scientists. Solid state physicists were proud of Briouin zone, of group theory, of collective phenomena, of good physical statistics, they were not that much interested about uh, real defects or even in defect at all. We had the dichotomy uh, in France, but not only, between solid state physicists and material scientists, between beautiful, in quotation marks, physics versus dirty physics. And indeed, physics with defects is more complicated than physics of ideal crystals. So it's not surprising that it took decades to overcome this philosophical uh, dichotomy between physicists and material scientists. Next slide. It is uh, quite normal that one has to start with simple ideas like circles for planets or circles for bore or divots, and only then 
can one go to more complex models? Next slide. You go to more complex models with some kind of Oedipus mode. And I quote Heine, not the poet, but Volker Heine, who said, who spoke of throwing out case space, an Oedipus uh, attitude in a way. Next slide. But uh, Heine and uh, Ducastel and others had to be proud of a um, new model if it works. And if the model works, publish it better in English, in good English, and keep on working with it pragmatically. Next slide. So, because I can recall uh, of, uh, I can recall Newton's gravitational law, it worked. And if it works, just be pragmatic and use it. Even if you don't have physical explanations like the Cartesian on the continent would have liked to have. And the physical explanation only came a few centuries later with Einstein's general relativity. So there was no way to wait for physical explanation. And one had to use Newton's gravitational law as much as possible. Next slide. And uh, this was, to me, this was clearly the spirit of uh, Finis and Sinclair uh, 1985 philosophical magazine paper. They wrote clearly, the present approach is empirical. The consequences of the form of the model do not depend on the physical interpretation. So no need for physical explanation or interpretation in depth. This approach was for the purpose of atomistic simulation, explicitly for crystals containing defects and using a rapid algorithm for calculating the force on each atom. Next slide. And uh, for fundamental justifications, they came later on. For instance, the case of local charge neutrality. As for Frieder's ideas, uh, Frieder's ideas were rather intuitive, but they proved to be fruitful and they were justified later on by experience and by theory. Next slide. The Finis Sinclair started in Howell the, and, and in Paris. At the Howell Center, Jim Sinclair was waiting for a flexible atomic potential to be embedded in his multi-scale approach. And Jim was interested in all kinds of discussions and he was well-versed at code programming. Mike Finis, when he was in 1983 at a second workshop in Paris, uh, he said he had plenty of time to think and derive analytical expressions because he was in a quiet flat in the inspiring Rue du Bac. And I found that Laplace also lived Rue du Bac. So a uh, famous uh, street indeed with famous people living there. So Jim and uh, Mike and Jim developed a rapid algorithm for calculating the force on each atom was that a way to fulfill Laplace's dream? I would answer no, because as Jim Sinclair knew it, and as we all know, uh, each scale actually requires its own tools, which one could call emerging tools from the previous uh, lower scale, lower scale uh, modelization model. Next slide. So to, to repeat, inseminated by several papers by Friedel, uh, some of them were not uh, easy to understand, uh, as well as other developments by other people like Slater, who throw out the group and pest. The idea of embedding energy, of embedding atom uh, in an effective mod medium, like glue model, and the idea of atoms having to share the electronic bonds with their neighbors slowly 
grew up in the 1980s. You had the embedded atom model, the glue model, also in 1983, uh, 1984. Next slide. That was also true for semiconductors because also of time binding. Friedel again with his pupils Lano and Alain. And from another point of view, Abel's 1985 paper about metallic bonding inspired Tersov potential in 1986 for silicon. Next slide. That as soon as you have many body interatomic potentials, you have many parameter functions and you have to use sophisticated functions. For tetrahedral semiconductors, for instance, you need an explicit angular dependence. Next slide. The parameters need to be optimized and uh, you need to use optimization algorithm efficiently based on large databases. This is, as uh, Richard said, the spirit of machine learned interatomic potentials the spirit of artificial intelligence with big computers. Next slide. And this is actually the spirit of operational research uh, since uh, for centuries. The question being how to choose a best solution to a complex problem. Next slide. In operational research for decades, if not for centuries, you have to define a cost function. You have to define a good procedure for a global search for the best or an optimum solution. And that cost function must be defined with a large database where big data comes into play. Next slide. That started 35 years ago for this, in order to get a silicon adapted interatomic potentials which had about 10 parameters. Dotson in 1987 used simulated annealing to get the best parameter set. His, uh, his function, unfortunately, was not good enough and or his uh, database was too limited. That's what Tersov said in 1988, and he then did a little better. Artificial intelligence actually depends on very big database bases and also on very large cost functions, as clever as possible. So the spirit may not be new with respect to operational research, uh, with respect to what was done uh, in a long time ago, but computers and algorithms are much more powerful. Next slide. So about uh, number of parameters, might be fun to recall uh, John von Neumann's caveat. With four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can make wiggle his trunk. Next slide. The answer is that this is not true. For metals, you cannot fit the Cauchy discrepancy between uh, elastic constants using pairwise atomic potentials, no matter how many pairwise potential you use and how many potentials you put in them. Similarly, for semiconductors, the form of Tersov 1986, later improved in 1988, that form was not suitable uh, for, uh, to get tetrahedral uh, covalent bonds. So one needs to be clever at all stages. Next stage, next, next slide, sorry. So here come my limited conclusions, Lim natural and artificial. Can we hope to fulfill Laplace's dream? Unfortunately, no, I don't think so because each scale actually requires its own emerging tools, its own scale. So at each scale, you need to be clever, have good numerics and use natural and, arti and artificial intelligence. And that's a bright feature for all this. Uh, next, next and final slide, that it's time for question. 
uh, yes, it's time for a question. If you want to to get some and next slide to get some bibliography, maybe. I used uh, Rorison's excellent book. He's a chemist in Oxford about cohesion and intermolecular forces. I also used Stephen Brush, excellent book and articles. And then I used some articles I wrote myself and one with Adrian uh, in memory of Jacques Friedel. Thank you. Can go back to the previous side. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second. Okay, thank you. I hope it all worked. I hope everyone could see the slides. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, well, uh, if you have questions, put them in the, put them in the chat um, before, like, like before. I mean, I might say something first. I mean, actually, it's interesting because there were some people some things that I was not aware of somewhere between like the beginning of the 19th century uh, and like the, the work from uh, even before Van der Waals and um, Holtzman, these were the periodic potential. Uh, that was very interesting. I was not aware of that. Um, Belskovich, yeah. Yeah, so there's this very interesting, the things you can come up with when you don't have experimental data to, uh, to compare with. Anybody, anybody want to raise any questions? Maybe, I mean, I appreciate that, that, that you were mostly talking about the history and I don't, and, but I, I think you've done some work yourself in this area. So what's the limit of these, of these effective, these, these sort of multi, many body potentials? So in terms of metals, where, what are the things they can recover? And what are the things they fundamentally cannot describe? I mean, you already talked about things. They, they, they cannot describe electronic properties. Sure, but is there even because obviously the sort of example, the sort of probably we talked about more like cohesive energy, defect from vacancy formation energy. So these things they can recover, but but are there? If we ignore the fact that obviously yes, they can't um, describe any phenomenon that explicitly depends on, on on the electrons. Are there things where basically even the functional form is not sort of like other classical phenomena where the functional form is still not sufficiently rich to describe? Uh, those sort of phenomena, or can they basically do any sort of like fundamentally? Is there describe any sort of um, classical mechanical property of metals? Um, uh, I think I agree with what Richard already said. You have to have the good physics in your uh, forms, in your analytical forms. For instance, if you do not include uh, angular dependence, you will not be able to describe silicon or carbon in their diamond form. Sure, so yeah. You, you must think of what is your problem and be sure that uh, at least the you have some ideas of the physics in the form, in the analytical form you propose. Now, people who are developing machine learned uh, interatomic potentials, they use so many possible functions that I guess they can have everything. <laughs> Not explicitly. You, you cannot say by sight, by seeing at their, at their forms, ah, okay, I recognize uh, what I want in this particular form. No, they use too many, too many potentials, but they use uh, thousands of uh, polynomials. That the data. Forms. The data so, pick out what is important uh, rather than physical intuition. I mean, I guess that would work if you have enough data, if there's such a thing. Cool. It's, it's a problem of data. Use a lot of data and uh, and a lot of polynomials and with different shapes. I think there's also, coming back to Richard, this is an actually uh, a difference. Like if you fit to experimental data, you're somehow, you're, you're limited to the amount of data that's available. But if you, fit to, for example, DFT data for different geometries away from the, 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 the sort of you call it experimental crystal structure. You have a lot more data to fit potentials. Yes. To, that's one yes. of all these machine learning people. Uh, Artificial intelligence is um, mainly a matter of big data. And generating that big data. Yeah. Getting that. Either from experimentally available uh, data or DFT. 
you have to use both, of course. Okay. Big, big data. I don't see anyone else asking uh, a question in the chat. So I propose that we now transfer to Sally. And if you think about anything you wanted to ask Olivier in the meantime, just put it in the chat and we can come back to it at the end. Okay, so thank, thank you, you again. Thank you again, Olivier. Thank you again. And again. let's go to Sally. Okay, Sally's already sharing her screen, which is Good. great. Yeah, uh, you might go. that seems to work fine. Sally, uh, the floor is yours. Great, and thanks for the invitation to literally recap my history because I started my PhD on modeling the forces between two hydrogen atoms, hydrogen molecules. And by the time I started on UCL, it was between rigid organic molecules. And these are molecules which are defined by strong covalent bonds and the forces between them are relatively weak and can often be dominated by the van der Waals dispersion electron correlation effects, which are so hard for even electronic structure methods to model accurately. And I've since moved on to larger organic molecules and pharmaceuticals where these weak effects from intermolecular forces can be enough in the condensed phases to cause conformational change. And we're using this in uh, crystal structure prediction. So the holy grail is to have an accurate model for the forces between molecules that could be used to predict all the physical properties of both the gas, the solid and the liquid, and therefore the phase transitions within experimental error. Now, this is of course provided you have the correct theory and method of simulating that property. And the current state is that usually when people are making, uh, trying to make comparisons between experimental data and the simulations, there's a mixture of how much is the simulation in error and how much of the error is due to the models used for the forces between molecules. What many people have referred to as the Bible for reaching this for small molecules is this book by Anthony Stone, The Theory of Intermolecular Forces. And that has a very detailed theory in there and lots of the key references up to about 2012. And if I'm not, anything I'm not giving in another acknowledgement to in this talk comes from this book. A key point of going to the condensed phases is the problem with the pairwise additive approximation, which we've just had mentioned, that the total energy of a system of N molecules minus the sum of the isolated molecule energies is usually approximated by a sum over intermolecular pair potentials. But actually, when you've got even three molecules, the energy is different from the sum of the three pairwise additives by a three-body correction term, then there can be a four-body correction term, etc. And these non-additive effects can be important. For instance, the inductional polarization, one ch charge iron outside a molecule will induce a dipole, put an iron on the other side, there's no dipole and interaction energy with that. And this carries on to a dipolar field. The dispersion, the R to the minus six, is the correlated dipolar fluctuations in the molecules. And then, therefore, when you've got three molecules in a, in a triangle, there is a correction three-body term here, as given here for um, spherical atoms. And also, the deformation energy, the energy of changing your conformation, and these are usually conformational changes around um, carbon single bonds, though some angles and the position of hydrogen bonding protons can move along the covalent bond. This can be very non-additive and difficult. However, this holy grail success has been achieved for argon. Going from the Leonard-Jones potential there was a lot of development till in about the 1970s, various groups of people were able to get an intermolecular pair potential for argon that was able to cover the phases, the known physical properties there. 
Um, here's one example, the Barker's Fisher Watts, where for the condensed phases of the liquid thermodynamics and solids, they added the three body axrod teller dispersion term as their only not additive effect, and also looked at spectroscopy and gas transport data. And here you can see that they had the long range dispersion coefficients, not only the C6, but the C8 and the C10, and those coefficients were calculated. And then the exponential, approximately exponential repulsive wall was fitted to experimental data. And you can see there's a polynomial multiplying the dispersion. So spherical intermolecular forces um, were sort of captured by the 1980s. But to go from there to polyatomics, it makes sense to use an atom-atom model because summing the intermolecular potential between the different atoms, here for acetylene, you know, you've got four carbon-carbon, eight carbon-hydrogen and four hydrogen-hydrogen um, interactions. But this diagram emphasizes that you have some of your interactions are very close where there'll be overlap of charge distributions and some are far more distant. But the atom-atom model has the advantage that's got the approximate shape of the molecule and can change with conformation, which is why this model is used in the traditional biological atom-atom force fields, where you have a term for stretching the bonds, changing the angles and a torsion term there. And then the intermolecular term here, Leonard Jones repulsion dispersion and a point charge electrostatic model. And although these are of an intermolecular form in the biological force fields, intramolecular terms are modeled as intermolecular, usually from going from the one four, I separated by three bond atoms and above. And if you look at this molecule here, well, there's a hydrogen off this methyl group, and there's a hydrogen off this aromatic group, and they get extremely close when it's the molecules in this conformation, giving a bit of a bar barrier there, and it would obviously prefer to be rotated round um, to be either non-planar or planar for the methyl in the other group. So there is a problem that the intra, a lot of torsional potentials come from these close intramolecular potentials. Having said this, there, there are widely used biological force fields where man years have gone into the parameterization of them. And for the limit of type, range of types that they have parameterized and those types of simulations, they're absolutely really excellent and there's a long, history of using these. But this aspect of considering transferability of atomic types um, can be illustrated if you consider benzene and methane, to make them neutral, you've got a very different relationship between the charge on the carbon and the hydrogen. And if the charge associated with a different atom is different, then the other terms will be somewhat different in the transferability. So, Clearly for this sort of molecule, you've got four different hydrogens, one is oxygen, nitrogen, aromatic hydrogen, and a methyl hydrogen. But do you need more? Do you count these two oxygens as the same? And the electrostatic terms, the best you can use if you are using a point charge are potential derived charges where you're fitting the charges to the, um, electrostatic potential outside the molecule as calculated directly from the charge distribution of the molecule. These show that you have very limited transferability, but also that is partly in the problem of the conformational dependence. You've got a mix of the genuine change in the charge distribution of each atom as you change the conformation and the artifact of the error absorption that you're getting in fitting. So the contributions we have to the energy of interactions between rigid close shell molecules, well, at long range, when the 
you can assume that the charge, charge overlap is negligible between the two molecules. Then you can use um, perturbation theory and the multiple expansion, and you can get analytical forms for those contributions as a function of parameters that are properties of the isolated molecule. So we have the electrostatic term whose sign going from positive to negative has a huge effect on the orientation dependence, the polarization induction and the dispersion, which is this universal attractive glue and some other smaller terms with the R to the minus N dependence. And at short range, you've got the exponential dependence approximately, where the exchange repulsion, which is highly repulsive at short range, dominates at short range. But this also affects the other terms, and you have exchange induction, disper exchange dispersion, and potentially charge transfer. And these terms, once you've got this electron exchange and overlap, well, this is then at least amenable to numerical um, calculations by, for example, symmetry adapted perturbation theory. So this is all based the intermolecular interactions on acting as a perturbation to the charge distributions. The problem is that the most important part of the potential is the well region, which is where the long range and the short range terms are balancing each other. So if we look at the intermolecular forces at long range, well then the electrostatic interaction at first order is just that between the undistorted molecular charge densities. So you can calculate ab initio the charge densities, put them down and then just integrate over them. Or you can, in atomic modeling, you can represent that as the interaction between the atomic multipoles, charge, three components of dipole, um, five components of quadrupole, et cetera, on each atom. And there's some implicit summation dependence here. And these tensors, which give the orientation dependence and R dependence, well, they take up to uh, five pages of, um, to get up to R to the minus six in Anthony Stone's book. So it's a rather more complicated than your one over R of point charges. At second order of perturbation theory, then it, you're, you've got how the intermolecular interactions are changing the charge distribution of the other molecule. And this is modeled in terms of excited states. And so you can derive the induction polarization for example, the change in the charge distribution of molecule A from the electrostatic field of B, which is modeled by the polarizability of A and the net uh, field coming from B or more widely. And then you've got the energy of the interaction of the distorted charge distribution with the permanent charge distribution and of course, vice versa. And you can see that that can, is only the first term in the series. Similarly, the dispersion as it's correlated fluctuations in the electron density can be related to the integrals over the polarizabilities at imaginary frequencies. I'd like to emphasize first that the, a molecule is not a superposition of spherical atomic charge densities, as as soon as you think of chemistry, molecular orbital theory, you realize that the valence distribution is not distributed spherically. Here we've got the electron density of chlorine, where it, we've had taken off the charge density of spherical atoms. And of course, there's no electrostatic forces coming from the spherical atoms outside the charge distribution. And I hope you can see that the, if we just look at the top half of one atom, then that charge distribution is well modeled by a quadrupole moment where you've got the extra electron density from the lone pairs out at the side and refine that model with the um, 
octopole and um, dipole there. And so by using this multipolar expansion, you can reproduce the electrostatic energy outside the molecule to essentially the accuracy of the wave function that you're analyzing for the molecule. Now the electrostatic terms and this anisotropy is very important for getting the directionality of hydrogen bonding and pi pi interactions right. Um, Lagan and Millen, who were um, in UCL chemistry when I joined it, um, were famous for having derived from spectroscopy of um, pairs of small molecules, the rule that the hydrogen bonds tend to form two lone pair or pi electron densities. Uh, the polarizabilities of the atoms are also very anisotropic because it can be very different distorting the charge distribution along the bonds than perpendicular to the bonds. Um, the dispersion coefficients in principle are anisotropic, but these have a very large isotropic component. But of course, and if, if you are dividing up your molecule into um, atomic charge distributions, you've got this is going to depend on the method you use for splitting it, your charge density of your molecule into atomic contributions. This non-sphericity can also affect the short range. This is showing the experimental electron deformation density in solid chlorine, where you can also see the lone pairs being picked up. And their effect can be seen in the analysis of crystal structure contacts in crystals. And you can approach, chlorines can approach each other more closely head on than they can side on where there are the lone pairs. So this sort of theory is behind the distributed intermolecular force fields that can be applied to mon organic molecules. And Alcim Squita and Anti Stone have pioneered this one using their codes and theories. And so you can derive a model for the forces between molecules where the long range terms, the um, electrostatic atomic multipole moments, the polarizabilities and the dispersion coefficients are derived from the molecular charge density. And the long range terms are damped at short range to prevent the polarization catastrophe and then fit an anisotropic atom-atom form to the SAP DFT values for the exponential components. And the advantage of using a perturbation theory to calculate each contribution is that you can monitor the errors in fitting to each component, have an idea of the functional form and can drive that, and then can refine those short range parameters against the total interaction potential to help absorb errors. So we've derived this sort of workflow for deriving a potential going from calculating the molecular structure and then using its charge density to calculate the coefficients and fit the different terms and the model. And this is illustrated for trinitrobenzene where it's as a planar molecule got five distinct atomic types. And these show the rough sphericity of the um, different atoms with the oxygen and the nitrogen being particularly um, aspherical. And here, the calculated SAP DFT values um, as points and the fit of each is shown for the molecules approaching separated by R for a variety of orientations. So it fits the theory, okay. So we move this approach we've also used before, um, the first pyridine potential um, we were working with when we attended a TYC seminar where Simon Parsons talked about work on pyridine. He had and challenged us to, to predict the structure of a new high pressure form of pyridine. 
And this is an overlay of that experimental structure with the structure that the student Alex Einar sent to him. We could not have done that with a um, non-empirical potential that had been fitted to experimental properties, because if you're fitting experimental crystal structures, you're not sampling up the repulsive wall in the way you do in, uh, when there's the um, crystals are under pressure. We'd also successfully used um, this approach for a, uh, in the blind test of crystal structure prediction for this molecule um, with chlorine and bromine and fluorine substituents and correctly got it as the most stable structure we'd approached. That was without induction. Afterwards, we've put in the induction terms into our solid state modeling program. It can only be done as a single point energy after optimization. But with that, the trinitrobenzene potential, we were able to do crystal structure prediction, generated the observed and many competitive structures. And there are a few of the competitive structures here in dotted lines and the full lines of the observed structures. And this sort of illustrates how much um, the relative energies, lattice energies change with different refinements of the model. But the big change actually was from ch changing the electrostatic model to improve that um, and the partitioning there. So this approach was much better than our standard model, but the energy is still dependent on the force field derivation details. But the big limitation was that in trinitrobenzene, you can see that some of the nitro torsion angles are not the 180 of the planar structure we'd observed. And these small changes do make a large difference to the energy and the packing density. So crystal structure prediction at lattice energy level, currently a lot of people are using density functional theory on hundreds and thousands of crystal structures to get their final energies. Um, it's plane wave density for functional theory, which has to be supplemented by a model for the um, dispersion, usually the C6. Improved models for the dispersion are recently being introduced by people like Kachenko and Erin Johnson to improve that. But these methods are very CPU intensive. There are many methods being used but we're not going to be able to use these for molecular dynamics simulations. If we use this approach to intermolecular forces where you're calculating the charge distribution of the molecule for each conformation, that gives you the intramolecular energy deformation energy and the distributed multipoles that can go into the electrostatic term in the intermolecular energy. Most of the time we've been using um, an empirically fitted X6 to, that's been fitted to the crystal structures. But as I've just been talking about, there are these non-empirical methods for the intermolecular interactions being developed. And this is the most accurate way of getting the intermolecular forces for a given type of wave function or of density functional on the Jacobs ladder. And these have a lot better prospects of being used in molecular dynamics if we could have an analytical form for the intramolecular energy for dis distortions. Why am I so keen on a molecular dynamics force field? Well, we want to do, be able to do the liquid state, but also there is a big problem of over prediction of crystal structures that many structures that are distinct lattice energy minima merge to be the same structure when they're merging, when that, you know, the molecules are vibrating. And uh, Matteo Sabalgio has, and Nicolas Francia have developed a workflow for looking at using molecular dynamics to, to reduce the number of structures we're considering. I just want to concentrate on the first step of their workflow, 
which is looking at checking that the classical force field is going to be adequate for these purposes. And here you've got some idea of the situation. So we've taken the lattice energies of hundreds of structures from the CSP in increasing order. And there you've got the contrast of the amber force field for urea with the model we use for CSP. Here for succinic acid, there's the gaff force field and also some periodic PBE plus TS um, energies. They both agree that our calculations are way off for the three structures that have these rather short hydrogen bonds and contacts there. Um, succinic acid, we've also looked at more periodic density functional theories with different minimizations and different dispersion corrections for the three known structures and a few hypothetical structures. And you can see there is this sensitivity to the dispersion correction. And actually a um, polymorph that has been seen once and never again, it looks like being the most stable until you put the temperature in and calculate the free energies. So we need molecular dynamics with good enough force fields. And I want to emphasize that no conventional molecular dynamics force field has been adequate in blind tests of crystal structure prediction on pharmaceuticals. This is because the balance of the inter and intramolecular forces is absolutely essential. If you get the wrong confirmation, you can't pack correctly. We also do not um, reflect the directionality of hydrogen bonds if you use an isotropic atom atom potential. And we've got the limitation, the parameterization by fitting experimental data only samples the low energy region, not the repulsive wall or barriers. And we've often got limited experimental data available. However, you know, for pharmaceuticals, you could use different force fields for inter and intramolecular forces. Um, this slide just emphasizes that the torsional potential for rotating these bonds is very sensitive to the quality of wave functions you'd use. I don't think anyone will be using Hartree Fock these days. And it has been shown that um, we can improve our crystal structure prediction by using really high quality um, molecular wave functions for the intramolecular energy. But if we assume one of those curves is correct, then you can fit a torsional potential very nicely to it as one term for the traditional um, torsional form for the electronic change in contribution, and then an atom-atom term for the contacts that you get under changing as you torsion around, um, as you change the torsion angle. So to conclude, a specific molecule determines the degree of conformational flexibility, the number of atomic types, and the anisotropy of the atoms, and hence complexity of any anisotropic atom-atom potential that could rival or beat electronic structure calculations. But the problem is that specific application codes often restrict the functional form for you of the model potentials you can use. So um, avant-garde simulation have a force field factory which will produce traditional force fields for pharmaceuticals for modeling, but they use the same data to fit a separate force field where they've decoupled the atomic types to inter and intra to be able to use even in the first stage of their crystal structure prediction. We've got the problem that anisotropic atoms produce non-central forces and torques. You've got a dipole on the nitrogen, then you've got a torque that's trying to pull around the rest of the molecule. 
Nonetheless, these sort of models are being increasingly involved, used. Um, the amoebo force field that's developing in Timica for biological molecules, and there's Orient um, for gas phase and surfaces and clusters. DMA Chris we've been using for crystals and other codes are being increasingly developed. So for look at modeling the forces between molecules, we're now looking very much at trying to get a transferable approach rather than a transferable atomic um, potential. And if you look at the history and the huge range of potentials for modeling water in all its phases and spectroscopy properties, and the number of people who've got a career developed on modeling water, you can see the extent to which this is a challenge of getting a good enough uh, model for the purposes that you're interested in. So I'd like to finish with acknowledging, um, in addition to the people whose um, names have come up in the references, first of all, uh, my ex-supervisor, Anthony Stone, who is still actively working on intermolecular forces and has been responsible for not only the book, but also a lot of the coding, working very closely with Alstom Squeeter, who's been pushing forward these transferable potentials. And also um, Morris Leslie, who started working on DMA Chris with me when he was at CCP5. And um, I've had a lot of help from both him and Anthony in their retirement on pushing this forward um, and working with the PhD students, the two people who I've um, particularly noticed don't work used is Alex Einar and Uga Agago Usar. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sally. Are there any questions for Sally? I saw there's a comment from Aston. Which, Alston, sorry, uh, which I'm not going to completely read, but basically summarizing saying that he agrees with, with Sally and basically good ab initio force fields can beat DFT uh, in terms of their accuracy. Are there any specific questions uh, for Sally? So you can put them in the, in the, in the chat. Actually, maybe I will well, I'll take my privilege as chair to ask a, a first question. So I was thinking about these things like hydrogen bonds and other these sort of direct, more directional um, molecular inter intermolecular interactions. So is it challenge with modeling them that basically they're sort of a halfway house between inter and intramolecular? What I mean is in the sense that they are directional and they look in some aspects more like a, a, a covalent bond between inverted commas uh, compared to other more classical of like in, to other less directional intermolecular interactions. Um. So, you know, there's a huge range and a continuum of, for example, hydrogen bonding um, to the extent of how much overlap of the charge distribution is involved. But apart from saying that, you know, quantum mechanics is, gives you a complete continuum, we can still get a very long way with the hydrogen bonding, provided we put in the anisotropy of the electrostatic interaction. So, you know, that isn't treating it as a weak covalent bond, mm. but, you know, there has been a lot of debate. Uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics, there was a lot of problems of base set superposition error and other things overemphasizing the degree of charge transfer. It does exist, but you have to be very careful that you're not overestimating it um, from you, the use of inadequate basis sets, et cetera. Um, and it was one, you know, putting in that anisotropy in the electrostatics in the early Buckingham Fowl model and since then has made a huge difference. Um, and I think Alston would like yeah. to comment further. Alston, co comment, please. Um. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to just follow what Sally has just said. I mean, in addition to the electrostatics, uh, 
getting it right, especially for hydrogen bonding, um, you do need to include uh, charge, what people call charge trans fiber for calling it charge de delocalization. I mean, this is what is like an incipient, incipient uh, chemical bond. I mean, charge is moving in these in the, uh, in the hydrogen bond. And there are ways to include this effect, but it is subtle and it's probably the least understood, the least well modeled part of intermolecular interactions. And of course, the other thing we have to get right is the polarization. It's uh, it's not sufficient just to have static multipoles. You've got to have uh, a dynamic uh, a response there. And uh, when you get this right, when you get the charge transfer, which then makes the bond shorter because you now have, and then you have the polarization, which strengthens the electrostatic part. That's what's needed. And that's what DFT gets mostly right. You know, when DFT works as like in your black box, you know, it, it gets the hydrogen bonding mostly right. It overestimates the charge delocalization. We all know that. But it's this part of DFT which has the edge over most force fields. But we are getting there with uh, with Abinishu. Thank you. Excellent. Awesome. Any other questions? If not, I mean, then I would like to thank Sally for her excellent uh, talk. I would yes, like. I, I would like. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Olivier, you go ahead. Yes, I have a question uh, about DFT and ab initio. Uh, do you have to use uh, configuration uh, interaction and couple cluster methods? And because for um, instance, DFT in principle does not reproduce uh, the the dispersion interactions. Yeah, oh, oh, quite. That's, that is the big problem um, with, you know, people saying they're going to model the whole crystal by DFT. Yes. Um, it doesn't have the dispersion interactions which have Can to be added. To use a um, but, or... but that's why we're advocating not, um, not doing the, the ab initio calculation on the whole ensemble, but doing it on the I isolated molecule and deriving the dispersion coefficients from um, the charge density of the isolated molecule. And there you can do that for whatever sophistication of um, uh, charge density, you know, you could use quite ex ex extended correlated molecular charge distributions for doing that. Yep, so it you can go to, you can improve the quality of your model of the charge distribution of the molecule systematically or by other methods, and then in principle, use that to derive your model for the forces between the molecules. You know, there can be practical problems and that, um, particularly with partitioning that charge density between uh, between um, atoms, but in principle, um, you do want to have as high quality um, model of your wave function to be able to have something that is correctly reproducing how it will react to the other molecules around it. Well, I think Alston wants to come back come back in to also uh, reply. Uh, if I may, uh, thank sure. You. Uh, again, just to just to follow up on what Sally has said uh, and answer the question. I mean, if you were if you were entering into the dispersion problem from the from the abinitious point of view of force fields, quite often you resort to SAPT symmetry adapted perturbation theory because that gives you a very well defined. Uh, 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 the uh, determination of the dispersion energy at all separations, including overlap. Now, if you come in from it, uh, on the other hand, if, if you enter this from the DFT point of view, you start adding either empirical corrections or uh, uh, Alex Tachenko's, you know, very nice uh, many body dispersion model, which by the way, goes beyond standard SAPT in the sense that it includes uh, uh, many body effects, which are not always present in the SAPT approach. However, there's a difference in how bodies are defined in these two methods. So it's a bit, it's not that simple either. So, you know, it's possible to, uh, you don't, you, you can go to correlated methods like couple cluster for, or even couple cluster based SAPT for dispersion energy, benchmark dispersion energy evaluations. But most, for most uh, problems, 
uh, perturbation theory based SAPT or density functional based SAPT methods give you a very good uh, estimate for the dispersion. And it's that dispersion which is then embedded in the force fields Sally has talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Now, looking in view of the time since we're running over, I just want to uh, almost finish, but just before we finish, I want to, to um, uh, reference something that uh, Mike Finnis uh, wrote uh, after Olivier's talk, which basically, very, I think, in response to my question uh, about what are the biggest sort of challenges with these potentials. And it is, uh, he wrote that it's basically treating magnetic and superconducting transformations and uh, multi component uh, metals, uh, but progress is being, uh, being made. And additionally, some uh, like a non-metal to save apart with the additional problem of long range of long range interactions. Thank you. So I think we'll stop here. Um, for those of you who are in in or near London, uh, next Friday we have the next TYC event, which will be a physical event at King's College London, which is about the uh, latest developments in DFT. For them. so, if you're interested in that, uh, please come along. Uh, details of that are on the TYC webpage. And then I would like to finish here, thank uh, our three speakers, uh, Sally, Olivier and Richard uh, for their uh, contribution. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and hope to see you all soon at another TYC event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.